now we have uh, Javier Ramirez from QuestDB, who is going to talk about analyzing time series data with Apache Beam and QuestDB. Round of applause for Javier. Yeah, so uh, I'm not really speaking about analyzing time series data. I mean, that's, that's cool, but I'm speaking mostly about the duplicating data. So that's the, the thing I really worry about today. Uh, and, and the first thing is like, why do I worry about you know, the duplicating data? So I want to speak in first about data duplication, which is uh, not, not that nice. Uh, I don't know if, I, can I see my screen here? Because right now I'm seeing the video here, sorry. Uh, oh, thank you for that. <laughs> so uh, first I'm going to speak about you know, data duplication. Then uh, I will just show you uh, like a real a demo with ingesting duplicating data and then the duplicating the data. Then I will tell you why I worry about duplicating data, why you know, we are working with 10 series, data, with 10 series data, and I will show you a little bit about what we do at QuestDB. It's an open source database, Apache 20 database. I, I keep losing the slides here. I see myself on the video. It, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I will tell you why you know, 10 series data can be, can be challenging, and then why I choose Beam to actually duplicate data, how I build it. It's only 25 minutes, so it's going to be interesting. The first thing is, why should you care, or why do I care about duplicating data? Well, if you are paying for something, and for some reason, like you know, the transaction comes twice, you don't really want to pay twice for the same thing. If you are doing any kind of transactional operations, duplicates are not really great. If you are doing analytics, some duplicates might be okay if they are not statistically significant, but eventually, like you know, duplicated data is not great for having the correct results. It's also, you are using more, this is more storage, not really double because of compression, but when you have duplicates, you are storing more data, and eventually you're using more resources. So that's not really ideal. But how you get duplicated data? Because you might be thinking, okay, just don't send the data twice. That would be super cool. But uh, when you are working with distributed systems, and if you are here at the Bean Summit, maybe you have working with distributed systems, it's very easy that you can have uh, the, the, source, the source of the data may be using uh, at least one semantics, meaning that maybe the data is sent to your server and after a timeout pass, if the original of the data didn't get a response, they are going to send again just in case. So maybe we are processing the data twice. But it can also be for some of the things. Maybe uh, we work quite a bit with uh, IoT devices. And IoT devices are tricky. Some of them, they really like sending data. They are super chatty. They can be sending you data like maybe, I don't know, I might have a air conditioning and it's sending me the temperature every half a second. And maybe the temperature is not changing every half a second. So I don't really need to keep, like, you know, to keep storing data every half a second. Maybe I only need to store data whenever it's changing. Or maybe I have a, a, I'm tracking a vehicle and, you know, and I want to change to, to, to store data every time it changes position or something. And, you know, whenever it moves, it gets a new result, uh, it gets a new event, and that's fine. But something we see, for example, when you're tracking data from ships, that a ship in the ocean is never really still. They anchor the ship, and the ship is always like moving a little bit, but it's not moving enough. So maybe, but the device doesn't know about the device still uses data. And maybe you don't want to send to store that data if the, if the ship is just moving a few meters because it's anchored. Maybe you want to, you know, not to ingest data until there's a significant uh, amount there. So you can get duplicates for many things. You can also get duplicates because, I don't know, I have a YAML file which is keeping a configuration for my Kafka consumer, and I have a topic, and I have a consumer group. Maybe I have several workers that I want to be collaboratively consuming from a consumer group, but I have a mistake on my configuration, and suddenly I have two consumers that are using a different consumer group, which means both of them are getting the same events twice. So maybe I'm getting one of those things. So there are many reasons why I could have duplicate data, how data is duplicated there, and it might be a problem for your use case. So I'm just going to show you uh, here like some duplicated data, what it looks like, and, you know, and, and what we are doing to not duplicate that. So if you, are, if you know BIM, there is a BIM example, which is a, one of these uh, game analytics example with a pipeline and so on. So I'm, I'm taking that same example, change a couple of things. But basically, what I have here is an injector. 
which is just generating data and just generating simulated game data. Uh, this is the SEPI task. It's like a, a team name, a username, uh, a score, and a timestamp. And I'm just generating, like, you know, right now I'm sending every second, I'm generating around between, it's like 3,000 events every second, but I have, like, you know, I have, like, a 500 margin. So some seconds will be 250, uh, some seconds will be uh, 3,000 3, events. But basically, I'm generating events into a text file. And I have here two different, because, you know, I'm stupid like that. I have here two processes. Both of them are tailing the same file, and they are sending to the same Kafka topic. So effectively, I'm sending every data twice, you know, every piece of data. And actually, the generator is already introducing some duplicates. So right now, I'm sending a lot of duplicated data into a Kafka topic. I have a beam pipeline here somewhere. Let me see where I have it here. So I have a beam pipeline here. This is just, you know, just a Apache beam. I'm just sending data to this pipeline. I have an option in my, in my sync, I will tell you about that, which says if I want to deduplicate, I'm saying don't deduplicate. So right now, I'm consuming data from that Kafka topic, and I'm sending the data to my database, to my open source time series database. And I have here a Grafana dashboard in which I'm showing you what I have. So this is like, you know, just some statistics of the information I'm consuming. But here I have this panel, which says, which is the number of duplicates. So I've seen 200 events, only one, so 200 events that are truly unique. But most of the events I have, I, I'm storing right now, are duplicates. Most of them, I've seen them twice. And some of them, even more than, you know, than two times. So I have a lot of duplicates, actually, right now on my system. And that's not nice. I mean, I get a lot of duplicated data. So what I did, and I will tell you the rest of the talk is going to be about, about that. What I can do is I just change my sync and say, I want to stop having duplicates. And if I start again, and I'll say, you know, the pipeline, we will see how the number of unique events, the ones that I've seen only once, start growing, and the other two stop, like, you know, at all. So from now on, I should see events only once, not two, not two times, not four times, not anything. Maybe it's clearer if I just truncate the table, I delete the data, and I start from scratch. So now I'm starting from scratch, and all the events I've seen only once. Of course, it depends on the uh, window. I'm duplicating here data. I'm going to show you about this. First, I wanted to start like you know, showing you what I'm doing. Then I will tell you how I built it and, and what it does. But basically here, I'm telling my, uh, I'm telling my, my sync to duplicate data with uh, 500 milliseconds. So if I see any event with the same data in 500 milliseconds, just don't send the duplicate. What I can do, I can go, I can say only five milliseconds. And actually, if I go to only five milliseconds, I will still get duplicates because, you know, some of the duplicate data, the duplicate data I'm getting it's, it's separated more than five milliseconds apart. So if everything goes well now, at some point, I should start seeing, or maybe not, but I, I, I should, with, with five milliseconds, I will expect, I have, maybe just uh, go really low to this, one millisecond apart. Okay, so that should be get, getting some duplicates. So the first thing I want to show you is like this, this kind of works, it duplicates data. If it's not sending duplicates, even better. But basically the thing is like, you know, uh, I'm not seeing any data twice now, even if I'm sending data from two different processes to the same Kafka topic. So it cannot be more duplicate than it is right now. So let me just stop this. And let me just continue with the slides. So I tell you a little bit about this. So I'm going to be speaking uh, about the trolling we had and why we wanted to get rid of duplicated data, why I built this, uh, this thing I have here. I'm going to be speaking about the time series database. So first thing first, what I'm going to tell you today, it works for a time series database, but it actually works for anything. You can duplicate data with BIM for any destination, for any sync. So in my case, I was doing it for a sync for QuestDB because I work at QuestDB. 
but you know you could use the same technique for the duplicating any kind of data. And actually, if even if I'm speaking about a time series database, if you have data and you can use a SQL database, go with it. The challenge is like sometimes when you're working with data, a traditional database is not really the best choice. Imagine you have uh, 500 devices in a factory, or 500 uh, you know mobile phones or users playing a game, or 500 financial instruments you are tracking, and every second you get one event for each of those uh, devices. One event every second, 500, it doesn't sound too big. But actually, in just one day, in just a few days, you get more data that you know, a conventional database will be happy with. So one of the challenges of working with time series data is that your data is going to be growing pretty fast to a size which is not really comfortable for a traditional database. And, and also, you need to have a life cycle policy how to deal with that data, how to, you know, what to do with the old data, what to do with some, with some of the things. So working with just ever-growing data is tricky. You also know working with tiny stamps is not fun. This is a joke, of course. You can laugh if you want. But you know, it's kind of stupid. But timestamps are really not simple to, to deal with. There are a lot of things with timestamp, time differences, a lot of things that can go wrong. And specifically, if you are working with data that changes over time at a scale, it can get very tricky very fast. Because for example, maybe I'm getting data every few microseconds from some device, or every few milliseconds, or every few minutes. But when they are doing analytics, maybe I want to do analytics only per hour, or every five minutes, or every two days. So one thing is the resolution I get from the data. The other is how I want to do the analytics. So you maybe have to do, uh, you know, you might want to do down sampling. You are going to be having missing data. You maybe want to join data with different, you know, with different resolution, with different timestamps. So for those kind of problems, you can use a time series database. QuestDB is a time series database we are building, Apache 2.0, fully open source, uh, no restriction whatsoever. You can run it on Google Cloud. You can run it on any other cloud provider. You could run it on Oracle Cloud if anyone is using that. So you can, like, you know, you, you can run QuestDB anywhere you want. Of course, you can run it on your own or your own hardware. Uh, in the team we are. About 20 people actually have a colleague here, so 10% of QuestDB is here today. But as, as, a, as a project, we have like you know slightly over 100 contributors, which is not too bad. I mean, uh, 2,000 stars, uh, tw sorry, uh, 12,000 stars or so on GitHub. So we are not the most popular database ever, but you know we are not too bad. We 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 have like you know a few users using QuestDB every day for processing large amounts of data. Uh, we 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 can ingest over 4 million rows per second on a single instance. But in real life, the most we see is people ingesting about 100,000 or so per second, every second of the day. And we, we like to, you know, we like to be known because we are open source, because we try to offer a nice developer experience, and because we have good performance, reasonable performance, even in, in small machines. I, we have like a large machine, we perform very well. A smaller machines, we, perf we try to perform uh, good enough. So that's kind of the, of the idea. And uh, we had a lot of users that were complaining because in QuestDB, we cannot really handle duplicates. I mean, if you send me the same data twice, we are going to ingest it twice. So that's kind of the idea. So I'm going to show you very quickly some of the things we can do with QuestDB for working with data, but we don't deal with duplicates, and how I build the sync for Beam to deal with the duplicate stolen. So one of the basic things when you're working with time series is actually working with a slice of, of time. And something we, we have at QuestDB is some interesting extensions for SQL. So you can do things like, I want to look for data in any, at any resolution, up to microsecond resolution, in a convenient way. But also working with time ranges. I don't know. For example, this query tells me, uh, I want to get all the trips uh, from this particular table that are in 2018 and two months afterwards. Or in 2018 and the 10 seconds at the beginning of the year. Or 2018 except for the last three days. Or these ones that I like it better, which say something like, I want to start on June 21st, my birthday, 2018, uh, two seconds before midnight. I want to analyze whatever happened in the four seconds after this particular time. And I want to do this for every day for the next seven days. So as you can I know, it, it's kind of weird, 
But if you try to do that with a conventional database, you have to write like a longer query. So this kind of thing is like the basic type of query you can do in a time series database, in our database. You can also do, of course, down sampling. I have data at any resolution, but I want to do this analytics. The same way that you do a group by in a, in a conventional database, you can do also a sample by. So in this case, we're grouping by time. So we want to do the average, or the minimum and the maximum, in intervals of one month. We want to run these calculations in intervals of 15 minutes. An important part of working with time series is identifying gaps in your calculation, in your, in your ingestion. So something you can do is like, I want to get these aggregates in intervals of one second. If I don't have any data in any of the intervals, I still want to output a row. And you can choose to uh, output with nulls, with the interpolation, with the previous value, with different strategies. So that's like, you know, kind of the things. Two more, and I go back to, uh, to, uh, to BIM. This one, I, I, this, this one is quite cool, actually. Sometimes on a, on a database, when we are with time, you want to know what, when was the last time you saw a particular combination of columns. But if you are working with SQL, you usually can say something like, I want to have like the lattice value of this particular column, the lattice of this other. But I, what I want to have is the lattice row for you know, a combination of columns. So here, what I, we are doing, we have the lattice on extension, which tells me, OK, based on the timestamp, give me the latest row for each combination of this and this with all the columns or the columns you want. So that's kind of the idea. Like, you, know, you can do those kind of things. You can join by time to different data sets, even if they have like different resolutions. Imagine you have one data, one table recording data every second, the other recording data every two hours. You want to join the closest timestamp. We have joins for that. So that's why people use QuestDB for working with data at a scale. We perform very well. We have convenient queries, that's pretty cool. But we don't deduplicate. We don't have primary keys. We support joins, but we don't have, you know, uh, we don't have like referential integrity or anything like that. If you ingest twice a, a row, we are going to store it twice because it makes sense sometimes. Sometimes you really want to have that. But some people were complaining. And every time people were telling me, hey, how can I avoid duplicates on QuestDB? We had two strategies. One was, uh, just do it on batch. Once you have your data ingested, do a select in which you just deduplicate and store into a table. It's not super convenient. And the other was put something in between. So I used to tell people, put some flink between you have, uh, you know, before your pipeline, if you, can, uh, if you can afford the latency. I mean, it's not a lot of latency, it's having a component there, but for some people it's quite important. So I used to tell them, put Flink in, bef in between, like, you know, your source of data and QuestDB, they duplicate on Flink. And after a while, I was telling them, why should I tell people to put Flink? Because maybe they don't know how to use it. It's, it's not super, if it's the first time you're using Flink or any streaming technology, it's not super easy. So I thought, maybe I can write the Flink connector so they can use it automatically. And then I thought, maybe I can do it in BIM. So you don't have to use Flink. So you can use Flink or Spark or Google Cloud Dataflow or SAMHSA or whichever you prefer. So that's why I decided to create a connector in BIM in which I could duplicate data in a, in a simple way. So I started doing this on Python because I prefer Python. Uh, QuestDB is written in Java, uh, mostly in Java with some C++ with some Rust, but I'm not a core developer in QuestDB. I'm a developer advocate. So my Java is super rusty. And Python, you know, I'm better at Python. So I, I know you can, you know, use Python with, uh, with BIM. So the first thing I did was writing my sync on Python. And it turns out it's pretty simple. You only have to write a p transform, which basically then, then call uh, dufan, and that's about it. So the p transform, all you have to do is implement the expand method. From the expand method, you call your dufan. And in Dufan, you only have to worry about what happens when you start the bundle in a database. So start the bundle is start the collection. And the bundle is flash and uh, finish the collection. And then I only have to, you know, uh, in every time I get an, an event, I have the process method, which is when I'm actually connecting to the, to the database. So I, I wrote this. It was pretty simple stuff. Just, you know, copying from other things on, uh, on GitHub. But, and this is how you use it from Python, 
but the trolling is Python support is not great in older runners. I told you a life link. When I, I tried first my sync on Python, reading from a text file, it was working fine. Reading from Kafka, it was not working fine. It turns out streaming support on Flink with Python reading from Kafka, it's full of traps. It's like, you know, it's not super easy. So it was like, okay, I'm going to do this in Java. And remember, I don't, I, I'm not very good at Java. I tried the documentation, it could be better. That's all I'm going to do. I, I, there are a lot, lot of people here that, uh, you know, B BIM is, is, is a great project. And, and as with all the great projects, you know, a lot of people use it. Some people have been using it for a while. So when you are, the easy things are easy, the hard things are, you know, terribly hard, at least for me. So writing the connector in Java took me a while. I used the MongoDB IO uh, sync as an example, and you know, it was, it was cool. I had to deal with auto value, which is some obscure library that apparently is used at Google, but not really outside that much. Uh, I, when I was trying to do that, I, I, I contacted my colleagues. It's like, hey, I'm doing this in Java. I have to use auto value. It's like, what's that? I thought it was only me, but no. So it's kind of tricky, but eventually, you know, eventually I made it work. And the good thing is like creating a sync on Java, it's the same, the same abstraction as on Python. You need to create a p transform in which you need to basically implement the expand method, which is going to be calling uh, uh, just the pardo on the, uh, the do function. Your do function have to worry about connecting when starting the bundle, flashing and disconnecting when finishing the bundle, and just implementing processing to do whatever you want to do. So that's, you know, that's kind of the thing. With that, you can write anything. So I still didn't speak about the duplication magic. And this is why it happens. So this is how you can implement the duplication for anything using BIM. For the duplicating in BIM, you have a primitive. It's a, 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 a transform already. It's called the duplicate. So basically, you can deduplicate by the whole value or by key. In my case, I'm deduplicating by key. When you deduplicate, you need to deduplicate on a window of time. So basically, before deduplicating, what I'm doing is I'm putting my items into windows. In my case, I want to deduplicate relative to each item. So first I tried with sliding windows, it didn't work, it didn't work really well. So what I'm doing now is like for each event, I'm starting a session. And that's in that session I have the a duration, which is like you know it's configurable when you when you uh, write the pipeline. So I tell okay, for each event I'm gonna start a session of, for example, 500 milliseconds, could be two hours, whatever. So the first time an event that we haven't seen in that window arrives, it's output immediately. And then for the duration of the session, if another event with the same key appears, it's just not uh, emitted. So you don't, have, uh, you don't have to wait until the end of the window to emit the event. It gets immediately, and all the others are just, you know, are just dropped silently. That's kind of the idea. So what I'm doing here, I just create a session for each one. And the first thing is like, I have to choose a key for my events. So I have a hashing function, which I'm just keying. So with this, you know, you could, you could deduplicate absolutely anything you want to do in your, uh, in your pipeline. As long as you have an, a key that is identical for your events, you can just uh, work with that, and it works. So this is how you use it from Java, which is what I showed you at the beginning. I have a pick collection. In my case, I'm calling to my sync, to my QuestDB.io write. I have to pass my uh, URL and the table I'm working with. If I want to use the duplication, if I'm going to be taking in, this is an option I have, if I want to take into consideration the timestamp or not, if I want to consider duplicate only if the timestamp is the same, or if I want to consider duplicate even if the timestamp is different but the content is the same. Uh, which is the, the duplication window in milliseconds, if I want to configure security or whatever, and that's about it. So now I can already tell my QuestDB users, if you want to use the duplication, you can just install BIM uh, on the runner duty fair. You put this and your data in your table will come without any, any duplicates. And you know, that's pretty cool because uh, that way we can, uh, we can have users uh, you know, just running their, their workloads without having to worry about duplication. If you don't know uh, QuestDB, it's open source, as I said. We have a managed version, 
which as of today runs only on AWS, hopefully in the future also on other cloud providers, but right now AWS because big. And yeah, it's, we have some free credits if you want to try it out. If you want to try open source, totally free. If you have any questions, more than happy to take them now or also during lunchtime.